Hello, my name is Robert Grossman, and I'm the founder of Black Diamond Leadership. I'd like to welcome you to this live presentation on an introduction to psychological safety. Today's webinar will last about a half an hour, and I invite you to ask questions during the webinar, and I will do my best to address them in line or towards the end. Um, I also am aware that several of you asked a very similar question when you registered which was how do we bring psychological safety to our leadership team? And it is my intention that by the end of this webinar, you'll have greater, a greater understanding and tools and resources that you can take to your leadership team to talk about the benefits of psychological safety. I'm also available to come in and speak to your leadership team about psychological safety. And if you happen to be part of an association that would benefit from a presentation, on this topic, please reach out to me. We're happy to talk to you about that as well. Some of you are watching this presentation live on, on YouTube. And being that it's live, we have a couple of problems. There we go. Some of you are watching this presentation live on YouTube. And if you are, I'd like to request that you subscribe to my channel and like this video. Uh, yeah, also, I'd be thrilled if you shared this video uh, with your community as well. So let's talk a little bit about who Black Diamond Leadership is and, and what we do. So we, we develop leaders and teams to be more engaged, productive, and happy so everyone wins. Our primary purpose is to improve psychological safety, thereby helping companies to avoid costly mistakes and improve learning and innovation. See, leaders and members of a team must have a really strong foundation in emotional intelligence, or I also call personal leadership and resilience. They must also be very skilled interpersonal communication and creating trust. And these three areas lead us towards psychological safety. Our programs and workshops and leadership coaching and talks move companies towards psychological safety by also creating accountability on organizations. What I mean by accountability, what types of behaviors lead towards psychological safety and what kind of behaviors take away from psychological safety. So during today's webinar, I will be addressing the following three learning objectives. Defining psychological safety, why psychological safety matters, and how to improve psychological safety. Let's start with a basic definition of what psychological safety is. It is a shared belief held by members of a team that it is safe for interpersonal risk-taking without fear of retribution, being humiliated, or harshly criticized. It's also important that we look at what psychological safety is not. So working in a psychologically safe environment does not mean people will always agree with one another for the sake of being nice. It also doesn't mean that people will offer unequivocal praise or unconditional support for everything that you have to say in the organization. It is about radical candor, about making it possible for productive disagreement and a free exchange of ideas. It's also about creating an environment where everyone's voice matters. And this we know, especially with today's workforce, <clears throat> is vitally important that people believe that their voices matter. Amy Edmondson likes to say that psychological safety is the soil, not the seed. And I want to share something that Amy said recently. When a work environment has a reasonably high psychological safety, good things happen. Mistakes are reported quickly so that prompt corrective actions can be taken. Seamless coordination across groups or departments is enabled and potentially game-changing ideas for innovation are shared. In short, psychological safety is a crucial source of value creation in organizations operating in a complex, changing environment. So why does it matter? What's so important about psychological safety? Well, in a psychologically safe workplace, people are not, they're not hindered by interpersonal fear. Um, they feel like they feel willing and able to take those interpersonal risks of candor. Um, they actually fear holding back their full participation more than they actually fear sharing a sensitive, threatening, or even wrong ideas. 
So psychologically safe organizations is one in which interpersonal fear is minimized so that team and organizational performance can be maximized in a knowledge intensive world. Gallup did a study of the US workforce a couple of years ago. And what they found was that three in 10 people agreed with the statement that their opinions count at work. Well, this clearly means that seven in, ten, seven in 10 disagree with that, and I would assert are less engaged at work. Gallup did realize, or they further extrapolated, that if we could just move that ratio from three in 10 to six in 10, companies could realize a 27% reduction in turnover, a 42% lower absenteeism rate, a 40% reduction in safety incidences, a 17% increase in productivity, and a 21% increase in profitability. So we live in a VUCA world now, and VUCA stands for Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. We all know that we live in a VUCA world coming out of COVID and what COVID did to our entire work environment, let alone our society. So there's also another challenge, and that innovation is moving faster than our capacity as human beings to take advantage of it. So there's this gap, and we believe that psychological safety fills that gap. See, employees today at all levels are spending 50% more time collaborating than they did just 20 years ago. It used to be you went to work, you did your job, if you're on the floor, you pulled the lever, whatever you did, you didn't really talk to other people, you didn't innovate, you didn't bring up ideas of how to improve the processes, you just did your job. Well, those days are gone. And in fact, today we're all knowledge workers and growth is driven by ideas and ingenuity of people on the team. People must bring their brains to work and collaborate with each other to solve problems and accomplish work that is perpetually changing. For knowledge work to flourish, the workplace must be one in which people feel able to share their knowledge. Google recently did a study of 180 teams, and this project that they led was called Aristotle. And they concluded that it wasn't enough just to have A players. What they did find is that the human need that team players need is called psychological safety. And Google found it to be the number one predictor for team effectiveness. So what they discovered was that even extremely smart, high-powered employees at Google needed psychologically safe work environments to contribute to the talents that they had to offer. They found other factors, of course, that helped explain team performance, like very clear goals and dependable colleagues and that work was personally meaningful and that people believed that their work had an impact. So what we're really looking at doing is how do we erase fear from organizations? So again, in a psychologically safe workplace, people are not hindered by interpersonal fear, right? They feel willing to take the risks of candor in order to move things forward. I wanna share a couple of case studies about where psychological safety wasn't present that led to disasters. But first we wanna talk about a culture of silence or a Cassandra culture. So a Cassandra culture is an environment in which speaking up is belittled and warnings go unheeded. Okay, speaking up is belittled and warnings go unheeded. Think about the space shuttle disaster when engineers reported that there might be a problem with the O-rings, which led to the explosion, but their warnings went unheeded. So the Cassandra effect is especially relevant when speaking up entails detailing, drawing, sorry, when speaking up draws attention to unpleasant outcomes, as was the case for Cassandra in, in her predictions of war. It's easy for others to not listen or believe. So a culture of silence is thus not only one that inhibits speaking up, but one in which people fail to listen thoughtfully to those who do speak up, especially when they're bringing unpleasant news. 
And we could probably think of a few other companies out there right now where there was a fear to speak up, especially when there is unpleasant news. And companies such as Wells Fargo comes to mind, Volkswagen, Nokia, and others. We also look at, uh, at what we call invisible silence. And one of the most important things to keep in mind is wherever, wherever you work, is that the failure for an employee or team member to speak up in a crucial moment cannot be seen, right? This is true whether the employee is on the front line of customer service on the shop floor or sitting next to you at the executive boardroom. Because not offering ideas is an invisible act. It's hard to engage in real-time course correction. And psychological safety is not about personality or personality differences, but rather it is a feature of the workplace that leaders can and must help create. We know that fear consumes creativity. Research in neuroscience shows that fear consumes psychologic resources, diverting them from the parts of the brain that manage working memory and processing new information. This impairs, impairs analytic thinking, creative insight, and problem solving. So we want to look at workplace silence about what was not said. And there's a case study of in, in 1990, 1977, two jumbo jets collided on a runway and 583 people were killed. Now this takes place at a very small airport and it involves a Lufthansa plane and a Pan Am plane. And the, run, uh, the small airport had more planes than usual, and it was fogged in. Well, the Lufthansa plane was lined up for, for takeoff, and the captain started to roll when the first officer said, wait, we don't have clearance. Now, it's important to note that this captain was the captain of captains. Right? He was the captain that certified other 747 pilots. He was their poster captain. Right? He was a big deal at Lufthansa. So he said, yeah, you're right, get clearance. So the first officer radioed the air traffic controllers. Air traffic controllers said, do not take off, but after you take off, follow this course heading. And at that moment, the captain said, we're going, and he pushed the throttles forward. The first officer and the engineer were silent. As the plane barreled down the runway, picking up speed, it became clear that the Pan Am jet was across the runway, but it was too late. They tried to rotate the plane, but they didn't have enough speed and the plane stalled and they collided, again, killing everybody on board. So even though the first officer and engineer knew that their lives were at risk, the workplace silence or the fear of speaking up even overpowered that. So another one is called unconscious calculators. The tiny newborn twins, the tiny newborn twins seemed healthy enough, but their early age at only 27 weeks gestation meant that they were at high risk for having um, lung issues. Well, fortunately, the, the babies were in the hands of a nurse practitioner in the neonatal unit at this urban hospital. And the nurse was taking care of these infants when the doctor, the neonatologist, walked up to the babies, looked at the charts, and turned around either to walk away. Christina, the nurse, realized that the doctor did not prescribe a medication, a new protocol for young babies to help their lungs develop. She didn't question it for a couple of reasons, one of which was that it was still a judgment call by the doctors. But more importantly, when the doctor turned around, she thought to herself, the doctor knows best. Later in an interview, Christina reported that she saw this doctor berate other nurses for challenging his orders. So she decided in the moment to not say anything. So what we call this is an uncal unconscious calculator. In hesitating, then choosing not to speak up, Christina was making a quick micro assessment, not entirely conscious. Risk calculation, the kind of micro assessment that most of us make numerous times a day. Most likely she was not even aware that she had weighed the risks of being belittled or berated against the risk that the babies might in fact need the medication to thrive. She told herself the doctor knew better than she did and she was not confident that he would welcome her input. So inadvertently, what she had done is something that psychologists call discounting the future 
or underweighing the more important issues of the patient's health today, which would take some time to play out, over weighing of the importance of the doctor's possible response, which would happen immediately. In the end, the babies were fine. So they got the care that they needed, but this is a really important aspect of psychological safety. So a big part of it, again, is danger of silence. People see something unsafe or wrong and they fear reporting it. People feel bullied or intimidated by someone, but they don't report it. Fear of speaking up can be hazardous to human health. This can lead to widespread frustrations, anxiety, depression, and even physical harm. So now we want to look at innovation. How does psychological safety improve innovation? Well, number one, to embrace change. People need to feel safe to take risks and challenge the status quo. Here's an example of what happens without psychological safety and how a lack of psychological safety can crush innovation. When you look at leadership, they are controlling, top-down, and toxic in a not psychologically safe environment. Employees tend to comply, hide mistakes, and maintain their reputation, and innovation is stifled by the need to preserve the status quo. With psychological safety, leaders are inquiring, bottom-up, mission-driven. Team members challenge ideas. They, they learn from their mistakes, and they also serve the mission. And innovation, everyone's encouraged to try new things and see how we can innovate new ideas. So envisioning the psychologically safe work environment really comes down to knowing and understanding that remaining silent due to the fear of interpersonal risks can make the difference between life and death, right? We learned that airplanes have crashed, financial institutions have fallen, and hospital patients have died unnecessarily because individuals were, for reasons having to do with the climate in which they work, afraid to speak up. This fear has also led to disgruntled employees, workplace violence, and even extreme measures such as depression and taking one's life. This is why psychological safety is directly tied to total worker health. But we know that it doesn't need to happen this way. So had Christina, the neonatal nurse, worked in a hospital where she felt psychologically safe, she would have hesitated, sorry, she would not have hesitated to ask the neonatologist whether or not he thought that treating the newborns with a new medication was warranted. Here, too, she might not have even been aware of making a conscious decision to speak up. It was simply seen, seemed natural for her to check. She would have taken for granted that her voice was appreciated, even if what she said didn't lead to the change in patient's care. In a climate characterized by psychological safety, which blends trust and respect, the neonatologist might have quickly agreed with Christina and called the pharmacy to put in an order. Or he might have explained why he thought it wasn't warranted in this case. Either way, the unit would be better off as the result. The patient would have received life-changing medication or the team would have learned more about the subtleties of neonatal medicine. Before leaving the room, the doctor might even thank Christina for her intervention. He'd be glad that he could rely on her to speak up in cases where he might have slipped up or forgot something because he was distracted. So where do we begin this journey of creating psychological safety? Well, you're starting it right now by being on this webinar. But there are four components to the road to psychological safety. And we're going to learn about these components kind of in reverse order. So, scratch that. We're going to learn about them in the proper order. <laughs> so, the road to psychological safety begins with personal leadership and resilience. People must be able to manage their emotions, especially their distressing emotions when under pressure. And their resilience is that when they do have an emotional response and they're off their A game, they can get back on their A game right away. When leaders and team members have a high level of emotional intelligence, they can engage in effective communications with each other. Right? Their listening goes up. Their speaking goes up. They check in with the other person to ensure that their message was sent properly. 
they don't get thrown off when they hear something that might be upsetting to them. Instead, they ask for clarification. Once you develop your, your interpersonal communication, then we can start really looking at interpersonal trust, how to have more trusting relationships through integrity and being your word and, and everything that goes along with trust. And finally, when you have that kind of trust, now we can explore accountability in which team members are able to tell other team members when they experience, when they witness behavior that is not psychologically safe or doesn't serve the mission, that they can speak up in a helpful way, right? The other side of it is below the line behavior. So positive behavior above the line serves the company's mission, below the line takes away from it. That's in this situation too, in a psychologically safe environment, it, team members can speak to each other about how to improve psychological safety. So psychological safety on the field, how does this really show up? I wanna share a quick case study. Um, I'm working with a leadership team at a very large pharmaceutical company. And recently in a coaching call, one of the leaders shared with me when he was giving a presentation to his team, he misspelled a couple of words on the presentation. And in the middle of the presentation, one of the employees that reports to him raised their hand and pointed out the mistake. So he shared with me that, that before going through this training and, and development work, he would have responded in a snarky, kind of mean way. He would have belittled the person and made some ridiculous excuse for why the words were misspelled. And that, of course, would have led to a lack of psychological safety. But instead, he recognized that he was having an emotional response to it, and he chose in the moment to respond differently and instead thanked the team member for her observation and thanked her for pointing it out to him so that he could correct it for next time. He then followed up and said, you know, that's a great example of where I used emotional intelligence to manage my response. And at the same time, I increased psychological safety on my team. So next is how do we measure team cohesion or team psychological safety? And, and we're gonna talk about an assessment that the assessment that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. What the assessment allows us to do is understand where a team is today. What is the level of psychological safety? And then we're able to draw a map to how to reach and improve a higher degree of psychological safety via different interventions, workshops, coaching, whatever is entailed, whatever is required to improve psychological safety on a team. The scan measures psychological safety on four axes. Number one, willingness to help. This is the degree to which people are willing to help each other. The attitude towards risk and failure. This is the degree to which it is permissible to make mistakes on a team. Inclusion and diversity, which is the degree that you can be yourself and are welcomed for being who you are. Notice that we didn't say diver um, diversity and inclusion because we believe that you must have inclusion first before you can have diversity of thought and participation. And finally, the willingness to help, the degree to which people are willing to help each other while at work. So when we take the scan, we get a very simple report, and I'm gonna show you just a couple of pages from the report. So what you're seeing right now is the overall level of psychological safety on this particular team. And the score is relatively low. It's 65 out of 100. What you're seeing on this report right now are two different colored boxes. One's gray and one's orange. The gray represents the very first or the baseline assessment that we gave this team. And the orange represents the new level of psychological safety after a couple of months of intervention work and you know, workshops and coaching. But you can still see, and you can see, sorry, you can see in the middle um, that there's a dotted line and there's a dotted line that's grayed out. That was the original medium. And now there's the new medium. So we did move it up a little bit. There are still some people that are lower on the scale. And then we see the orange box got a little bit smaller, which means the standard deviation also decreased. Here's an example of attitude towards risk and failure. And here we made a big improvement in the medium, right? The line moved up really far, but we still have people that are a little lower on it and people that are at the very top of the scale. So there's still more work to do on this team. But you can see how improvement was made 
by working on things like emotional intelligence and communication. Open conversation, we saw a big improvement. However, there's still one or two members of this team that probably need some individual coaching in order to catch up with the rest of the team. So this is the assessment platform that we use. This is an example of the report that we use. Uh, we'll do a debrief on this report and then suggest an intervention to improve it. People always want to ask us, ask me, well, what is the typical um, process? Well, the first one is first we have to get stakeholder alignment. And then we give a base level assessment and then we do an intervention. And at some point we give another base, uh, another assessment to see if we're moving in the right direction. If we're not, we adjust what we're doing. We continue with the intervention and we assess again. And this process can take anywhere from six months to a year, depending on the team and the willingness of the organization or the team leader to invest in this. So there are some practices that you can start right now to improve psychological safety. And number one is improve your own emotional intelligence. Here's the thing. So when something happens, a communication or an event happens and we respond emotionally, we're not really seeing things as clearly as they might need to be seen because we are in an emotional state in that moment. So emotional intelligence is really just the process of recognizing that and engaging our rational brain. So when you're in an emotional response, the, the skill is to recognize it and pause, hit the pause button, stop that response. I call that the response chain. Stop that response and choose a different way, a different outcome, a different way of behaving. You like you should avoid blame and criticism in front of others. Um, calling people out in front of their peers uh, can lead to a lack of psychological safety, and it might be a conversation that should happen in private. And um, and then we also want to you also need to develop your own interpersonal dialogue skills to engage in such conversations, and that leads to building interpersonal trust with people. And building trust, there's a lot of dimensions to building interpersonal trust but a big part of it is being your word. And then also we mentioned earlier about being accountable for above the line behavior and below the line behavior, but first you need to be accountable to your own behavior. Another way of seeing, saying this is you see something, you own what you see, you solve it, and then you do it, you fix it. Learning how to engage in coaching conversations is an incredible skill to build a better team, trust, and psychological safety. Coaching conversations differ than normal co conversations because in the coaching conversation, your commitment really is to the betterment of the other person. You're asking more questions. It's a constant process of developing other people by helping them find reasons why they were not as successful as they could be and what they want to do about it. Embracing ideas from everyone. This doesn't mean you have to act on ideas from everyone, but if you shut people down from sharing an idea, they're less likely to contribute an idea later on. And they may come up with a game-changing idea later on that they don't share because their manager shut them down in the past. Psychological safety really applies towards the manager and the team members. Earlier on in the presentation, I said, you know, psychological safety doesn't mean that people are going to be nice for the sake of being nice. So as somebody who contributes the idea or the thought, I need to be willing to be told that that idea is not relevant right now or we can talk about it later without getting upset. Um, to become a learning organization, to learn from mistakes rather than criticize for mistakes, we want people to report mistakes as soon as possible. If we know about the mistakes, then we can take corrective action quickly and promptly. And then we can learn from those mistakes. Right? Amy Edmondson, when she was studying high-performance teams at hospitals, she came up with the premise that low-performing teams would have a much higher rate of mistakes and errors than high-performing teams. But as she studied this, she was shocked to learn that it was the opposite. The low-performing teams had a very low rate of reported mistakes and accidents, with a high-performing team had a lot more. She was shocked by this, but then she realized what was going on. The low-performing team was afraid to report their mistakes, so they swept them under the carpet. They hit them. They didn't let people know about it, and in many situations, bad things happened. The high-performing team felt safe 
to share their mistakes. They felt safe to report mistakes quickly so they could brainstorm and come up with quick reactions, or sorry, quick actions to fix what was going on. Express gratitude and recognition with people on your team. This doesn't mean that you need to shower people every single day with praises, but when you express gratitude with people, it builds. They'll express gratitude with other people. Gratitude's a very, very powerful motivator, and so is recognition. Definitely want to avoid gossip in the office place, right? Gossip leads nowhere good. It leaves people feeling like they're being talked about behind their back. People are more afraid. It is one of the most toxic things that happens in organizations. And there is no room for ego. You need to check your ego at the door in order to create a psychologically safe environment. Now, there are three, three basic strategies that I'm going to share with you right now. And strategy one is to focus on learning, not on the results. Focus on learning, not on the results. And the quote on the screen, for those of you who might not have video playing, is that when you make a mistake, there are only two things that you should do ever do about it. Number one, let me back up again. When making a mistake, there are three things that you should do about it. Number one, admit it. Number two, learn from it. And number three, don't repeat it. C.S. Lewis said um, that humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. And this is strategy number two, acknowledge your own fallibility. And strategy number three is model curiosity and ask a lot of questions. Lou Holtz said, I've never learned anything talking. I've only learned things from asking questions. I do have a thank you offer for those people who are on the webinar today and registered for the webinar, even if you didn't make the webinar. And the complimentary gift is a free complimentary, <laughs> a free psychological safety scan and debrief for your team. Now there's a couple of requirements to redeem the free scan. Number one, you must have attended this webinar live or registered for it. Number two, you must have a team between five and 25 members. Number three, have the authority or the ability to recommend psychological safety or interventions for your team. Number four, agree to the confidentiality of the scan results. This is important. Okay? It's in my contract that if you hire me to come in and do a scan, I will not show you the results of the scan. There are two different reports, one's for me, one's for you. Right? And so in order to maintain confidentiality and psychological safety, it's imperative that the people who are taking the scan know that their identity will be protected. And finally, um, I'd like you to schedule the scan by June 30th. So if you're interested in the scan, just send me an email, robert at blackdiamondleadership.com. If you've attended the webinar live or registered for it, you will get an email um, with the same offer shortly after the web webinar and we'll just set it up. The scan itself takes about three minutes, and then the debrief could take anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour, but we'll probably limit the debrief to about 30 minutes. All right, any questions out there? Questions, questions. I see some questions right away. Um, let me see though, the first question is, oh, that's a good question, because people are attending this webinar from around the world. Um, if I'm not in your area, can you still help us? And the answer is, Absolutely, yes. Uh, the one thing that COVID has done is taught us how, how to lead workshops and programs over the web. So no matter where you are, we can absolutely help you. Okay. Um, have people been hurt by psychological safety? Um, that's a great question. Not to my knowledge. Um, I, I think that some people didn't like psychological safety because they couldn't handle the candor and in those situations, if they were a really valuable team member, then typically I would coach them one-to-one -to, -one to help them through that process. Um, if they're not a valuable team member, you know, then it's up to the team leader to do whatever they need to do. Um, understand your intervention time frame. What are some things that you do? Great question. Thank you. Uh, we always begin with emotional intelligence. It's the first step. Uh, we developed we develop the leaders and the team members level of EI. 
so that they can respond to those um, um, distressing events um, in a more positive manner. And um, that's anywhere from one to three or four workshops, depending on how deep you want to get with emotional intelligence. Then we spend time talking about um, communication, how to have conversations, uh, the whole concept of sending a message and then how it's encoded and it has to be decoded and that the person receiving the message might hear something completely different than what you intended to say. So there is a process to make sure that doesn't happen. And we also look at perceptions and all this is all this happens because we all have different ways of seeing the world. We we have different colored lenses or glasses on and um, and based on our backgrounds, our heritage, a whole bunch of different things we see the world differently than each other. So we need to even amp up the communication more. Um, next up would be working on interpersonal trust. And um, and that that's a, a very intensive, wonderful process where um, team members really do grow to trust each other. And it's all based in the conversation process. So it builds on the interpersonal communication process. All right, that's it for the questions. Um, we're going to close out this web webinar. Um, again, if you have any questions for me, by all means, reach out to me. My email again is robert at blackdiamondleadership.com. My phone number is on the screen. Um, if you are watching this live or registered, you'll get my contact information in an email. Um, if you're watching it on, on YouTube, um, there's an area where you can get my information pretty easily but I'm easily found on the internet. Um, again, if you are watching this on YouTube, I would greatly appreciate you hitting subscribe. And if you like this video, please hit the like button as well. Thank you all very much for being here today. I appreciate your participation.